Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for exploring the National Park Service units in Massachusetts. Contra contrary to some signs you may see along state roads, there are not any national parks in Massachusetts. There are, however, 16 different locations in the state that are under the jurisdiction of the National Park Service. They represent a variety of unit designations ranging from historical sites to recreation areas to a national seashore. So our guide today, Steve Farrar, will take us on a tour of local places that can give us a taste of the National Park Service right here in our own backyard, or at least within a distance of a day trip. And Steve, as we all know, has visited all our country's national parks including hiking to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, scuba diving the coral reefs of the Virgin Islands, camping among the wolves on Isle Royale, scaling rock faces in Yosemite, and climbing to the summits of Mount Rainier and Denali. Uh, so all uh, 60 of us or so, or 65 of us, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Steve for joining us here this morning. And Steve, you can take it away. Thanks so much. All right, great. You, you can add to those experiences. Last week I was out in Utah in Moab and rappelling into to Red Rock slot canyons. <laughs> there, there are a plethora of experiences of, available by visiting our national parks. When, when I say that we have uh, no national parks here in, in Massachusetts, this is a list of the 423 units that are under the jurisdiction of the National Park Service. As you can see, the, there, there are no hierarchical order, but the crown jewels are in fact the 63 national parks, none of which are in Massachusetts. Gets a bit confusing because the Park Service has partnered for marketing purposes with L.L. Bean and a few others to, to find your park and they're, they're starting to reference all of the units that are under their jurisdiction as national parks. If you drive down 128 on the side of uh, Lexington exit uh, 2A, you'll see a brown National Park Service sign that says National Park, this exit. But we're gonna go through today and, and any of the National Park Service units, if they have a visitor center, you can bring your National Park Service passport and get a stamp, whether it's the National Park or any of the other units, um, to collect them, to prove that you were there, the date, the, as remembrances and stuff. So that's kind of a fun thing to do. These are the units that we'll be visiting in a, in a whirlwind tour. I'm going to hurry through, through them, not spending any length of time on any one or we wouldn't finish in an hour. But those are all of the units in Massachusetts that, in fact, the National Park Service administers. So without further ado, let's start out west. Um, the Appalachian Trail is one of the national trail systems um, entries. The, the map, as you can see, the white line is the Appalachian Trail, 90 miles of which, in fact, go through western Massachusetts on, on its way from Georgia to Maine or Maine to Georgia, whichever way you want to go. If you're coming south, there's your welcome to Massachusetts sign on the Appalachian Trail. You don't want to boast and brag about mountain climbing in Massachusetts if you've got relatives in Colorado with their 14,000 footers and stuff. But because the Connecticut River Valley is so low, just the Berkshires give you a, a very impressive view. So along the, along the Appalachian Trail, there are a few mountains, um, we call the mountains, hills, that uh, give you some uh, altitude. Mount Greylock is the highest mountain in Massachusetts at 30, almost 34, five, uh, 3,500 feet. And there is, in fact, a visitor center in a Mount Greylock visitor center in Adams, Massachusetts, where you could get a, a passport stamp. Um, it's impressive from up there. You're, you're towering up above the valley. They do have cabins spaced about a day's hike apart along the Appalachian Trail, if you've never been on it. They're 
one side open, uh, first come, first serve. There's no reservations of any sort. So eh, rainy days when fewer people want to spend the time out on the trail, it gets a bit crowded. But for the most part, there's, there's usually space available. There are a few spots. This is up in, on Mount Tom where you can, <laughs> if you're not afraid of heights, you can, you can get good views, good seats, good sun. Obviously, fall is much, much more popular. If you if you go out there in the fall, you're going to have company. There are a few streams where you have elevation and, and precipitation. You're going to have streams coming down. So there's a few token waterfalls, nothing that's going to make you forget Yosemite Falls or anything, but um, it's a nice background. Again, the, the backdrop in the fall, Mother Nature spreads their their col her colored quilt over the mountains and it's absolutely spectacular. So if you if you want to time it, wait another, well, we're in September now, so wait another month or month and a half. And uh, this is the site that'll greet, if you get a blue, blue sky day, that will greet you out there. Sticking, to, uh, coming a little bit further east, the Springfield Armory. This, this was an interesting visit. Um, I, to be honest, didn't harbor, I'm not a, a gun guy and I didn't really harbor hopes, but I wanted to go visit it. Absolutely far exceeded my expectations. It is a, is a wonderful take, if I do say so, for a, a full day. Very accessible. I know this is kind of busy, but in the, in the, the circle there, the oval, is, it's right downtown. So 291, Route 91, Route 90, it, it's easy to get to, very readily accessible. It's actually down by the Hall of, Basketball Hall of Fame. Uh, you get there, and this was, this was designed a long time ago. This was when General Washington actually asked Congress for the monies in 1794. Um, to open up a spot where he could get armaments for his congressional army. That was the layout. Interesting, he had to ask for it because while we were still under British rule prior to the Revolutionary War, uh, the British didn't care for their colonies making armaments, the, the fear being that they would take up arms against Britain. <laughs> which is exactly what happened. But they, the arms that we used in the Revolutionary War came from France. They were French made, they were all handmade. So very high quality, but everyone was a little bit different. David Ames from Easton requisitioned tools from Washington. He put together in order to replace the individual handmade gunsmiths, he proposed machinery production. This was absolutely the, our introduction into the Industrial Revolution replacement. Ford gets uh, credit for the interchangeable parts and his, his production line, but this was 1853. Uh, the American system of manufacturing gave, gave birth to interchangeable parts. So now all of a sudden you had guns that, that Literally, their, their parts were interchangeable. You walk through the timeline in the visitor center at the armory, and they go through which style of gun, musket, rifle, as, as it evolved over the ages, and what um, conflicts those particular model rifles or muskets were used in. Springfield became very, very important to the Union during the Civil War, because there were only two places where armaments were being manufactured. One was Harper's Ferry down in Virginia, and the other was Springfield. Well, Harper's Ferry got blown up. So that left Springfield as the only single source for all the, the Yankee armaments. Moving, moving along, World War I. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely fascinating. The uh, Eli Whitney, everybody knows cotton gin and his, uh, his invention there. Eli Whitney worked at the Springfield Armory and it was stunning how many very bright, very creative, very entrepreneurial 
people got their start in the Springfield Armory. The, the whole Connecticut River Valley pitched in, they were making arms there. Everybody had a slightly different idea of what would be a better format, a better way of make a better gun. So they split off. Employees of the Springfield Armory went off to form Colt, Smith & Wesson, Pratt & Whitney, Remington, the Winchester Rifle Company. All of these firms were in the Connecticut River Valley. They all sprang from employees of the uh, Springfield Armory. So it was pretty interesting. I mentioned World War I, um, the government <laughs> requisition, a quarter of a million of them to, to arm the troops. Now, if those were being handmade, that was not feasible in a short time period, but because of the lathes and the uh, machinery, they cranked out the Springfield rifle was known at the time as the most dependable and accurate weapon ever mass produced. This is a picture of the inside of the production facility at Springfield Armory. Um, <laughs> they began in, in the late 30s, production of the M1 rifle, first semi-automatic. Well, they, they successfully supplied the quarter of a million rifles requisitioned for World War I. And if you do well, you get revisited and ask for more. For World War II, how about three and a half million? <laughs> hey, we need to arm the troops. F through 1945, the Springfield Armory produced three and a half million M1 rifles. George Patton was not one for casual compliments. But in his words, the M1 rifle was the greatest battle implement ever devised. It, it, all of the superlatives, it was reliable. The fact that it was interchangeable, the troops that were trained for the use of it, they were all, if you had to use somebody else's rifle, if yours were gone or you came across one, you didn't have to be retrained. It was the same, everybody was using the same rifle. So Springfield Armory, really played an important role. As you walk through the visitor center, there's all kinds of displays and it's, it's, a, it's a good take for a rainy day. You spend there if you like reading, things like the musket, an organ of, how do you transport all of these <laughs> muskets back in the day? This is an organ, which was the carrying device that they could load on carriages and transport 11, one musket organ, transported 1,100 muskets uh, or any guns um, safely without fear of gumming them up or anything. Anyway, uh, it like I say, I, I repeat, it exceeded my expectations. It, it is a fun place. So let's, let's come east, Lowell National. I'm up in New Hampshire. The closest NPS visitor center to me is over at Lowell, the historical park. Lowell is right on the Merrimack River. This was the same time period, uh, mid 1800s. They used the Merrimack River with the construction of a few of the blue lines you see there are canals that were borrowing water from the river. The river drops 32 feet in, in a mile. It doesn't sound like an awful lot, but what it does is outside of the spring snow melt, it ensures that there's constant flow of water year round. And that enabled the, the birth of the Miracle Mile here, 1821. As we shifted into the industrial age, Merrick, Mile of Mills, all of the brick mills came up cheek to jowl along the Merrimack to use the, the water power. This was one of the canals that was built to subvert some of the, the stream. Water would come down the falls. And then this diagram shows you the water, the red arrows show the direction of the water. It would spin the wheel. The wheel was attached to by leather pulleys, belts, um, to turn the manufacturing machines inside. So you had constant, without use of any electrical power, constant driving of the machines. 
1850, Lowell was second only to Boston as the second largest city in all of Massachusetts. The mill complex, the 10 mills combined, employed 13,000 workers, most of whom were, were women, the Lowell, Lowell women. Um, not sure I'd be in a big hurry to have a loose apron in front of me if I had a spinning, <laughs> spinning loom there, but that, that's one of the weavers that was making textiles in the textile mills, which are on display in the visitor center there. You can see the, the workings of the shuttle and, the, and how the cloth was made. The Lowell Mill girls, 75% of that 13,000 workers were women. And this was a, a great social experiment because the mills wanted complete control over their employees. They, they, they built boarding houses, dormitories, but then they sought to exercise control over the behavior. They implemented uh, curfews and visitor rights, who could come and visit and this and that. And, they, and everybody revolted and said, I don't want that level of control and stuff. So it was, it was important in the development of that. You can still take a, a boat ride down Industrial Canyon uh, if you choose to on the on the canals, but I would suggest the trolley is more fun, a little more flexible. It, it's also on a track, but very, very knowledgeable um, employees of the park service that run the trolley and just soak in a lot of information about the mills and their their function. This is the visitor center where the finished product is on display the textiles that came out of the mills as well as the means of manufacturing them. That's the Lowell, Lowell Mills right off of Route 3. Head over to the coast and we have another NPS unit, the Salem Maritime NHS, National Historic Site. It's out just east of Peabody. If you get off of uh, 128 at Peabody, it snakes around out to the coast to Salem, where you have, th this was actually the first national historic site under the Park Service. International trade, obviously we had just broken free uh, from the, the yoke of the British. We were, didn't have a lot of money going on. We needed to boost up our, our monies. That came from taxes on the goods that were imported and exported from our new nascent country. Maritime, all the trade went through Salem. There was a custom house there, the port that all US ships exiting or entering, bringing cargo from the Far East uh, over in Asia came into Salem and you were greeted, you had to make a stop at the custom house. They collected the taxes. And it, it was kind of funny, if you go inside here for a visit, it's, it's rather plush. Um, the, the federal government wanted these rich ship captains to be impressed when they walked in. So you, you go in and there, there's cherry furniture and uh, a big sweeping staircase when you come in the front door and nice, nicer than a crude log cabin for the, for the new country to make a statement. The Derby House, these are some of the old um, owners, the wealthy, the, the ship owners in Salem. The Derbys were the ones that owned the East India Trading Company. East India Goods and Services inside of which China, there were no indoor plumbing early on in, in America. So everybody had ewers and, and pitchers and, and basins next to all of the wash, wash up for dinner and for bathing and stuff. Well, that required China. So those well-to-do wanted imported China, the best of which was from, in fact, the country of China, hence the name. Finest porcelain was made overseas, but that required quite a travel uh, to get unbroken porcelain across the Pacific Ocean back over here. Uh, they padded it with all kinds of straw and stuff for the, for the jostling uh, journey. 
but then they were well recompensed with the with the pricing. Whoops. I don't know what that was. Sorry about that. Um, far more lucrative trade was found in spices. Cinnamon is actually the bark of the cinnamon tree, and it's not not very delicate. <laughs> you can pack a lot of strips of cinnamon in a box and it's not gonna break. So it, it was some of the most profitable cargo. It was very lightweight, uh, didn't take a lot of room. You could bring lots of it in. So spice trade flourished. The friendship was one of the, this is a mock-up of the friendship. It's not the original. The original made 15 round the world trips. So it was a, a workhorse of a, of a trip. There was a Salem Armory. This was not for the manufacture of guns. This was because you had such imported valuable cargo on, in the uh, vicinity. It was ripe for perhaps being stolen. So there was an armory where the locals had guns to protect the merchandise, the inventory. The federal style buildings, I, everybody goes to Salem at Halloween to, to visit the witches and that's what it's known for. There's a, there's a great historic district with all these old federal style homes in the area. Good take. Another, another day trip. Siren August work, uh, Saugus Iron Works, sorry about that. Um, I wouldn't put this on the top of your must see list, but if you happen to be in the area, it's it's not far from Salem. You could swing by. Some of them you can drop in for an hour or so and say, okay, been there, done that. This is this is kind of one of those. There's basically these two buildings are the only two in sight. The uh, historic aspect of it is that all iron had to be imported from England and from Europe. This was the first place that we, the new country of America, actually started manufacturing their own ironworks. 1646 to 1670. It had a, a very small, very, very same river that was not as big as the Merrimack uh, at Lowell, but it channeled the water to drive the water wheel. And all it did was pump up and down the handle of the bellows. It takes a very hot fire to melt iron ore and to be liquid iron. So the bellows had to keep going. It was easier than tiring out somebody doing it to hook it up, let the water push the bellows. This is uh, Ranger Martha, <laughs> she's very knowledgeable. Um, she loves her job. She, she gives quite a talk about the place, but that's the, the inside of the iron works and the outside. It, it does, this is the little Saugus River that they drew the water from. Go in the wintertime, it, it uh, evokes a Courier and Ives picture <laughs> when, when you have the snow, but that's, that's all there is, is the two buildings. So it doesn't, doesn't warrant a long stop. So Steve, hey. uh, Steve uh, before you move on to Minuteman, uh, yep. So I have uh, gray and black boxes uh, appearing on your screen, um, uh, uh, sort of um, on the top of your screen, there's a bar and yeah. uh, there's a little bit of a box on the right. And for some reason, this happens from time to time. It's happened with other presenters as well. Uh, if you stop sharing your, your presentation and then sharing it again, I'm hoping those boxes go away. This may have happened to you and I once before, but it's happened yeah, to other folks as well. I, I don't know why. Uh, still there. No, no, they're good on, I, I don't see them anymore on my end. Oh, okay, great. So keep going, yep. All right, great. Minuteman National Historic Park, the word historic is missing, conspicuously mi missing from the one Route 128 sign. This is the, National Park, this exit, what they're pointing you to. Oh, now I'm <laughs> now I'm locked up. Sorry about the functional stuff. 
I actually can't advance the the screens. Uh oh, I sabotaged you, Steve. I know. Um, if you hit the arrow key or the space bar, nothing happens. Right. Hmm. Screen just shifted a little bit. It should. Okay, so now you've stopped sharing. So maybe try sharing again. Yep. Oh, sorry about that. I got to go through all of them. That's okay. At least I'm not seeing any black boxes. Okay. Right. It did go away. All right. You'd think by now we'd have this down. Yeah. Oh, a quick, a quick review of the uh, parks we've, <laughs> don't we've gone through. <laughs> Ironworks. And we're at Minuteman. Great. Minuteman runs along Route 2A, commemorates the opening battle of the American War. Lexington, Lincoln, Concord. It's the the Paul Revere route. The British are coming. The British are coming. The skirmishes were actually on when the British were coming back from. They they got wind that there was a stash of uh, Americans storing up arms in a barn out in Concord. So they were marching from Boston to go capture the armaments. The five mile battle road moves along Hart and these are these are great old buildings, Hartwell Tavern. April 18th was Paul Revere's ride. Paul Revere gets all the credit for the British are coming, the British are coming. He actually got captured <laughs> down the road. It was Dr. Prescott that got that escaped the British. He was the one that got to Hartwell Taverns and sounded the alert and told everybody that the British are coming. Paul Revere was under, under guard by the British. He got captured. But anyway, they got alerted. So the Minutemen were up at the, the North Bridge waiting when the British marched up uh, Battle Road. These are the uh, insides. If you're, if you're into colonial um, interior decorating, great ideas along these, these fantastic big wide open fireplaces with the cooking ovens and stuff, the original spinning wheels, all the furniture is, is original. So this is the insides, none of which have been touched. <laughs> These poor guys, they, they dress up in period garb and they're very good. They stay in character as though they were the Minutemen, but they have to wear these uh, these woolen long sleeves. So in the summertime, uh, my hat's off to them. They, <laughs> it's a little easier in the fall. But they'll tell you what happened, where the British came from, and how they were met and stuff. They, they keep a running dialogue. Uh, Hartwell's not the only one. Buckman's Tavern along Battle Road is there. Absolutely gorgeous colonial interiors. Nice wide pine floors and the big fireplace and stuff. Hancock Clark House is another one. This is actually, uh, my wife's maiden name is Clark. This is from her, she's a descendant of the Clarks that owned this house. So some of the furniture actually has her name on it. This is the Old North Bridge <laughs> where the colonials said fire back at the British on, on British troops for the first time. It really wasn't all that much of a battle. It, it sound, they reenacted and it looks huge. There were three people killed in the entire skirmish of the the <laughs> Old North Church. This is where the, the sh um, three killed, eight wounded. If you go there on Patriots Day now, the reenactments make it look like it was uh, quite a charge. And 
it's a it's a fun take. You got to get up early though. They they do at at sunrise. They reenact the battle. There's the Minuteman statue that's out there commemorating it. There's one in Concord, and then there's one out in Lexington. The Freedom Trail. <laughs> I grew up just outside of Boston in Medfield. The only time we ever went in to appreciate what we have here for history is when out of town visitors came. They go, oh, we want to walk the Freedom Trail. So you go in and you do it. <laughs> it's, it's a good take. Starts down at the Boston Common, the oldest public park in the United States. And there is a visitor center there. You can get a good map. So it's self-guided. You can take your time. It's, it's painted red. You really can't get lost. Um, goes by the state house. This one's a good take. I don't know if they allow the rubbings anymore. They used to do uh, headstone rubbings. This is the granary, and there's quite a few illuminaries there. Sam Adams is buried here. Actually, Paul Revere is as well. A lot of school trips, a lot of uh, buses pull up and with kids to visit it. The old South Meeting House was the largest building back in colonial era in Boston. This is where they got together and got all riled up and launched the, the Tea Party, the Boston Tea Party. This is where they marched from over to the port. The State House, the oldest building where the Boston Massacre was, it, which is actually commemorated by an inset <laughs> seal. But as you can see, it's at the intersection of, of uh, several streets. You got to wait until there's no, no cars coming in any direction to run out and get this shot because it's out in the middle of the street that is an active street. That's where British shot a few revolutionaries. Faneuil Hall, we go down there to have a, a good feed at the marketplace and, and uh, the push carts and stuff. It used to be the upstairs of which is still looks like this. This was the the where you'd bring your soapbox out and all the oratory if, if you were either running for elective positions or you wanted to rile up the, uh, the locals, you'd, you'd have a meeting here and get everybody all ginned up and stuff. It seats, seats quite a few. This is upstairs from the, the more commercial, better known aspect of Faneuil Hall Marketplace, which is a, a must take for visitors. As you walk along, there are some uh, placards, as you can see on the lower left, that, that describe what you're looking at. But other than, oh, that's an old house. If you don't have your, your guide book, your little trail map, you, you might walk right by and not even realize, oh, there's Paul Revere's house. So get your guide. There's, there's the statue of Paul Revere up at the North Church where the lanterns were hung, one if I land, two if I see which is still functional, actually. It's a beautiful church. They have services there. And stuff. Bunker Hill. <laughs> Bunker Hill was a fun, it's, it's great to learn about. There's obviously the obelisk there up on the top commemorating it. What happened at Bunker Hill and who won it? Well, the colonists took the high ground. They came in at night. They, they built these dirt berms to protect them from British fire. And they were up high, so they could hunker down behind the, the dirt arm uh, walls and be protected. So the British fired cannons at the walls. They tried to break them down. That didn't work. So they, they said, well, heck, look at the numbers. We got hundreds of British troops. We'll just march up the hill and take it. <laughs> well, they tried that, and they, got, they suffered unforeseen numbers of casualties. They kept getting mowed down so they'd retreat and then do the same darn thing. They'd march in a line right up the, the hill again and get mowed down. Eventually the colonists had to retreat. They, it wasn't because they, they were beaten. It was because they didn't have any more bullets to shoot. They ran out of ammo. So the British in, technically won the battle of Bunker Hill, but it was, it was kind of by default. And it, at a very costly price that the British had not in any way counted on. So here's a, 
an artist's conception of what was going on. There's a handful of colonists up at the top, just as fast as they could rearm, they would shoot British troops who just kept marching right up at them. So that's what went on at Bunker Hill. The last stop on the tour is the, the Navy Yard, the Charlestown Navy Yard, which if you happen to be in charge of, if you were the commandant, you got nice digs. <laughs> this is the overlooking the, the harbor, the commandant's house. The USS Constitution is still there. That's the last stop going there. And once a year, it does make its token voyage out, uh, uh, circumnavigation of the harbor, accompanied by much fanfare. So that's the Freedom Trail. Now, similar to that, there's, there's a Black Heritage Trail. This one is downtown. The, the red line that you see on the lower right is the Freedom Trail. The blue line is the Black Heritage Trail. Prior to the Civil War, over half of the 2,000 Blacks in the Boston area lived up on Beacon Hill. That was their jurisdiction. The trail starts from across from uh, St. Gaudens' bronze statue of the 54th Regiment. That was the, the Black Regiment that fought on the side of the Union in the Civil War. This one, you do need a, a guide for or you you'll just walk right by and not even realize what you're looking at the or walking past the houses are are not particularly well marked but you get a little background the the bucks of america was one of the three black militias that fought against the british this was middleton formed them this was his house you might walk right by this nondescript alley but down in the alley is the African Meeting House. This was where Frederick Douglass came and, and spoke to inspire black men to enlist. All the Yankees fighting for the blacks' freedom, he said, should be, it, it's your freedom they're fighting for. So he, he recruit, this was the recruitment station for blacks to sign up, enlist in the 54th Regiment that went down south and fought for their own freedom. But it doesn't look like very much. You'd have to know what you're looking at if, if you walk this trail. This is, this is right out on the, uh, on the common. First Black Regiment recruited in the North. That's St. Gaudens' bronze statue commemorating it. Out in the harbor, another NPS unit 34 of the Boston Harbor Islands are grouped together as a national recreation area. So they're under protection. You can go visit them, you can have a fine day, but nobody's gonna be building any condos on them or anything, they're protected. The oldest lighthouse anywhere in the United States is Little Brewster Islands Lighthouse, right at the entrance to the harbor. Fort Warren was built out there on George's Island to protect entrance into the Boston Harbor. It's a big one, Fort Warren. Um, it was named such after Dr. Joseph Warren. He was the one that, okay, one, land, they're coming by land, sent Paul Revere off to ride to Warren. He was actually at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Um, he refused to leave when everybody was retreating they said come on he was one of the officers they said come on get out of here we're, we're evacuating he refused to leave the the dead and dying um the wounded soldiers so he ended up getting killed by the the british because he stayed to help so fort warren was named after dr warren uh, pedix island at low tide is all connected sandbars fort andrews out in the harbor look at check that cannon out <laughs> as far as defense it was it was active up until world war ii is in terms of defending boston harbor from invasion because as a new country we didn't we didn't have much of a navy spain had a navy england had a navy portugal italy they all had warships we didn't so we had to protect our 
the entrance to our harbors. Port Andrews actually was, if you, if you see the film Shutter Island, um, again, I grew up in Medfield, the Medfield State Hospital rounds, which are decommissioned, were used for the interior filming of Shutter Island. The exterior views were filmed out on Fort, A Fort Andrews. So a lot of local stuff with Shutter Island. As I mentioned, you can go out to Thompson Island in a, in a private boat. You can put in the shore. There's Adirondacks waiting for you so you can admire the, the Boston skyline view. But again, nothing's being built there. There are There is a outward bound center that comes out, brings inner city youth out to go through ropes courses and team building exercises. Companies can, can hire it for the day and stuff. There's, there's the list of the islands that make up the National Recreate, the Boston Harbor National Recreation Area. Pretty nice sunset view from out there or nighttime view, Boston skyline. I've been chattering, so we're gonna national <laughs> Longfellow. Longfellow is funny. Uh, headquarters of General Washington, and it also was the home of Henry Longfellow. There were British loyalists in Boston who didn't weren't in a big hurry to. They they were still loyal to the king, but when it looked like Washington and his troops were marching to surround and lay siege to Boston. They thought maybe it's time to jump on one of these boats and go back over to England. So they left some of these magnificent buildings just vacated. So, so they fled back to England. Um, Washington moved in. He wasn't, this wasn't Valley Forge where he was in a tent in the snow and the mud. This was his digs during the siege of Boston. He moved in here. The uh, Vassal House was his headquarters. So he wasn't exactly roughing it. Um, 1837, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was at Harvard. He was a t young professor. He rented a room upstairs um, for his residence. He chose, chose very well for a bride, Fanny Appleton, um, when he chose her to get married as a wedding gift. Fanny's daddy, who had deep pockets, bought the house for them, and that was their wedding gift from him. He didn't have to just live in a room upstairs. He now had the whole, whole house. So he had his own opinions as to how to best use the space in the house. That bookshelf there actually was a window. It was the, the pair to the one on the right. But Henry Longfellow said, no, I need storage for my books. So he blocked out the window and put in a, a bookshelf. So there's custom touches to it. Beautiful garden out in the back that runs down open to the Charles River. You can walk the gardens. This monument there, this, this is looking with the Charles River to your back toward the house, uh, has carvings of some of the, the, his famous customers, Evangeline, Hiawatha, the village blacksmith and stuff. That's Wadsworth, Longfellow. JFK's birthplace is a national historic site. It was Rose and Kennedy's first home, rather nondescript, it's over in Brookline. There's a plaque outside that, that says, this is the birthplace of JFK. At that time, in 1917, the customary birthing was done at home. So the, the bed nearest the window is where Rose gave birth to, to John F. Kennedy. So all his, uh, if you want to see his nursery, his, his baby carriage and stuff, it's all still in place. Dining room is set with the family. <laughs> if you want to see that JFK, in fact, was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, there it is. <laughs> Not much of a take. If you want to learn about JFK, my personal suggestion, go out to the JFK Library, the Presidential Library out in Dorchester. You'd be challenged to get through that in a day. That's not under the Park Service. Frederick Law Olmsted easily could take a full hour with him. Also in Brookline, Mass, right off the down by the reservoir, is where his National Historic Site is. It is his home, 
It was also his professional office upstairs. Olmsted was the father of lands landscape architecture. He created the term, the profession. Initially, he went out and because Niagara Falls had fallen into rampant commercialism, when he heard of Yosemite and people wanting to put up hotels in Yosemite Valley and stuff, he scooted out there and kept, kept it from being developed. Um, his point was that in England, the haves had access to plush parks and trees and forests on their estates and the little people didn't. In America, he wanted everybody to have access to the same. So this is his workshop where he designed countless thousands and thousands, he and his son actually, um, the archives here get referenced. There, there's over 1 million original documents of the layout. Mid 1850s, a lot of the older established colleges and universities were just pro cropping up. He did, and if you do something well, you get tagged for it again. This is Bryn Mawr's campus. He designed, there's a, a short list of some of the designs that he came up with, the landscaping of Wellesley College, of the Phillips Academy, uh, all, University of Chicago, Maine, Rochester, Wellesley College, Yale University, you name it, they all, they all came and got in line for him. Oh, no. I don't know why this is doing this. There we go. Again. They came to him and said, well, since you're doing a nice job, here's a bunch of pig styes and, and swamps. Give the people of Man, the residents of Manhattan some place to go. He designed New York Central Park. Um, 840 acres of what was wasteland into a, this, <laughs> flowered gardens with paths and water and stuff. If you've ever been to North Carolina, the Biltmore Estate, uh, he didn't. He didn't have a hand in the house and the building of the mansion, but all the grounds, the down the hill, the terraced gardens, all his doing. The grounds of the Capitol building, he designed. Uh, did the same thing for Chicago's World Fair, outside of alongside Lake Michigan, turned swampland into the, the White City Fairgrounds. West Point designed the. The military academy grounds and and in boston the emerald necklace that circles boston was his doing a very important guy acadia national park he laid out worth worth more time than unfortunately i have to, to offer here today adams if you head down the southeast expressway you get to quincy adams is right off one of the main drags this was from 1849, what the birthplaces, the two homes of John Adams and John Quincy Adams looked like. They, that's what it looks like today. They're preserved. This one does have an entry fee. Uh, if you wanna go in and take a, a tour of Peacefield, which was home to four, four generations of the, not the TV Adams family. This was our founding father's Adams family with all the original furniture is, is still in place and stuff. Nice tour, they, they are very informative, the tour guides when they bring you through. It's the foot warmer there by the fireplace. They used to take coals out of the fire, put it in the foot and then slide that, that uh, long handled brass holder of coals under the covers to warm up the covers so that when you got in, it was all toasty. The one thing with the Adams, John Adams got around. He traveled extensively through Europe and always, always, always came back with volumes, books that he was impressed with. There's a heck of a garden out back, but to me, the big take here is the library. 14,000 volumes in John Adams' personal library, which for colonial days, 
that's that's darn impressive. More of the gardens. All the way down into Bedford now, the Whaling National Historic Park. This was the, the downtown district, the historical district. All the more ships sailed from New Bedford, whaling ships, than from all the other ports of the world combined. This was Whaling Central. And the same 13 block historic waterfront district is still there. Don't wear high heels if you're going there. The cobblestones are very uneven. <laughs> it's uh, very authentic. The, <laughs> the employees at the visitor center dress in period garb and they have a good time. This is another customs house because of all the whale oil and, and ships coming in. Uh, there was a separate customs house down there. This was actually predated the Salem custom, custom house as old as continuously run, but you have the same federal style buildings. The, the ship owners didn't go spend two years out at sea. They sat home in rather comfort. Uh, they, uh, they were rather wealthy, gorgeous homes some of which you can take tours through. Whale oil, short lifespan, 30 years, king of the world. If you wanted to read or do anything at night, you had a whale oil lamp and, and New Bedford is where all the whale oil came from. So much of the world got their source of light from New Bedford. But then kerosene was discovered. It was cleaner burning, burned longer. It replaced whale oil. But for 30 years, that was, that was the king. 1841, Herman Melville sent, set off on one of the whaling ships from New Bedford, the Akushnet. This is a plate commemorating the Akushnet. He wrote about it, of course, in his novel, Dick. Siemens Bethel is mentioned. And in the Sunday service services in Moby Dick, that's the <laughs> that's where the preacher preaches from. The, the mock up of a, of a boat above the congregation. They have an awesome museum there, huge building. They this is a half scale replica inside the museum, a half scale of a of a real whaling boat, which is pretty good size to fit inside of a museum. But in addition to it, they also have hanging from the rafters, five full authentic whale skeletons. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's quite, a, quite a take. A lot of vertical clearance in, in the design of this uh, museum. And the finest not that I make a hobby of it, but the Scrimshaw display, unsurpassed. You see the rowing out on the little skiffs and the, the throwing of the harpoons and the chasing of the whales and stuff is your image of what whaling was all about. Well, yes, that's during the short active hunt them down period, but there was a lot of downtime on a two year whaling ship uh, trip. So what they would do is they'd take the teeth of the sperm whales that they caught. And while they had time in their quarters, they would sit and carve the teeth. That, that's what Scrimshaw is. I say two years, the voyages could last up to four years and they had a lot of time in their, in their bed to sit around. So they would carve these magnificent Scrimshaw and there's quite a collection there. If that's your thing, this is, this is where you wanna to go to see it. Ernestina is a mock-up of a real whaling boat that's out in the harbor. Sunset over New Bedford Harbor. Slater Mill is actually in Rhode Island. It's over the line, but I included it in the mass because it's, it sits on, it's in Pawtucket. So it's a, about a nine iron over the, over the line from Massachusetts. This was the, they claim, their, their mill was in first before Lowell. Lowell got the idea of using the, the water driven to power the mill from them. Um, Wilkinson, is the, previous to this mill being set up, all individual little screws were hand cut. <laughs> so, so maybe one 
artisan could create a bucket full of them a day. Previously, they were all made by hand. Now, now you had lathes set up, and this is in the Me Mechanical Engineering Hall of Fame. Very, very similar setup to the, the Mills and Lowell. Those leather strap drive the belts. The belts were turned by the, the water coming down the Blackstone River. Just before it entered the Pawtucket Falls, enters the harbor. This is further up. The, the Blackstone River runs from Worcester all the way down there. You don't hear a, an awful lot about Blackstone River, but it's 48 miles from Worcester down to Pawtucket. It drops 440 feet along the 48 miles. So it's 10 feet per mile, constant flow of water. In the 1800s, there were over 100 mills. There were 10 in Lowell. There were over 100 along the Blackstone River that were using the water for powering the mills. So it was one of the busiest industrial corridors anywhere in the United States. In the mid 1800s. Hopedale is a town out in Blackstone Valley um, that was designed specifically for the mill sitting in the center there. They, they built the dorms and the, the layout for the workers. There were over 4,000 employees in the, in the one mill there, Draper Corporation. So go in the fall again, it's all deciduous fall foliage. I don't know why this is doing this. Doesn't doesn't want you to see the next one. Finally, I know we're at our hour, but we, we end up, there is one national seashore, Cape Cod National. The seashores run from Point Reyes in California all the way down to the, the Texas outer protective islands, the, the barrier islands, up the east coast the Outer Banks, Fire Island, and Cape Cod National Seashore is actually a, a good portion of the Outer Cape. The, all of the green there is protected National Seashore land. 40 miles of Cape Cod's seashore is under the National Park Service. So the southern edges of Cape Cod National Seashore are outside Chatham Harbor where we have the nesting grounds for the infamous piping plover. 5% of all of the plovers nest along the national seashore. So if you paid good money to have a, a four wheel drive permit to go out on the beach, there's, there's like a six weeks right in the middle of the summer where you can't use it. You can't go out on the beaches because they're laying their eggs. There are quite a few federally protected species out there. So. Don't, don't blame it all on the piping plover. Seals, uh, they haul out <laughs> at Pleasant Bay, nice temperature, they like it there. And they have lots of food supply for them, but they also in turn have turned into food supplies <laughs> and they attract the great whites. So you've heard of all kinds of great white sightings along there. The predators go where their food is. Monomoy actually is not National Park Service. That's Fish and Wildlife. Um, that's just south. So it's ba basically an extension of the National Park Service, the, the uh, National Seashore. But as you go up the arm, the outer arm of the Cape, East Ham is the big visitor center. Beautiful. Back drives, there's a boardwalk to go out to the, the marsh. I don't know why this is doing it. East Ham, go up the, <laughs> that's, that's early morning. That's before the hordes come. <laughs> you'll have, on a hot, sunny summer day, you'll have company there. That's the dunes at Eastham. Lots of lighthouses. Nosset Light is there, the northern entrance. It says five working lighthouses. There are quite a few that have been decommissioned. So as you go through <laughs> the headquarters at Marconi, um, there's there's the the director of the National Seashore, <laughs> and his view out his office window, which faces east. So you get quite a sunrise every morning. Not 
not not a rough assignment. Marconi eat so, so all the beaches that go up are all under national park jurisdiction. Marconi, they're also a swamp trail, a cedar trail that buffers between the sand dunes and the interior. They've built boardwalks so you don't have to slosh through the swamps to go visit it. Very nice of them. Highland Links actually is one of only six in all of the national 423 National Park Service lands. Six of them have a golf course, and Highland Links is one of them. It's on the Park Service land, Highland Light, up in Truro. Used to used to have a uh, resort there, but it's been turned into a museum. So it's right on. 20 yards away from the lighthouse. But as you get up to the end, if you look at the, the tan section of the map there, that's Provincetown, commercial Provincetown. The green section, 73% of all of Provincetown is owned by the Park Service. So the, an aerial view will show you to the upper right section, is the town of Provincetown. All of the dunes out, out on the outer side are Park Service lands, which they built a bike path so you can access it. You don't have to walk out there. It was actually in 1963, the first bike path that the Park Service ever built, seven miles long. Race Point, not a lot of visitors <laughs> make the trek out there, it's seven miles out there. Um, but if you go out there, you don't even have to take a whale watch trip. You, you can, that's where they come right off the shore. You can see right whales off of uh, race point. One more time, hopefully. The rest of the images are the buildings or the lighthouses that were brought out to the Provincetown to end to warn ships. This one didn't get warned <laughs> quite well early enough. It ran aground the bones of an old shipwreck. Wood end light. Long points right at the entrance to the harbor. There's a Provincetown harbor. It's an old one, built in the 1800s, still there. Sunset. Gorgeous on the inside, bay side of the Provincetown. So sorry for the technical difficulties, but that was, there's our whirlwind tour. And thank you all. If you've been following along, in our we started back in January with, with National Park presentations, and we've gone through more than a dozen of them. If you stayed with me, you've, you've now completed a complete tour of, of all the national parks. They're yours. You pay for them. I say go visit them. And a quick plug, if you want help visiting them, <laughs> we just returned last Sunday from our first, my, this is my son Brooks. Uh, he and I formed a, an adventure tour company called Best View Adventures. So if you want to sign on and, and have us be your guides to national parks, go to bestviewadventures.com and you can see upcoming trips. And stuff. So Steve, a wonderful job as always. Uh, if folks have any questions or comments, uh, now would be the time to get them in. Uh, Teresa says, thanks for a great presentation. Sally says, delightful presentation. Thank you, lots of good information and photos. Um, Chris uh, dropped in some uh, factoids uh, throughout the presentation in the chat. Uh, folks should uh, check those out. Uh, Joyce says, what I love about the events at Bunker Hill, the fact that it created evacuation day for a state holiday on March 17th, just in time for St. Patrick's Day. Right. Uh, Mariette says, thank you, beautiful photos. Joyce said, loved it all. Great overview of amazing locations. Sally says, fabulous presentation. Learned so much and enjoyed every minute. Joyce says, wonderful as always. And what was Steve's other website URL? Steve, do you want to type that into the chat? Uh, you can also email it to me and I can include it in the email tomorrow. Okay. Bestviewadventures.com. Bestviewadventures.com. 
Oh, that's, uh, Renee, that, that, that's the website, and I, I have an email link there. Yeah. Uh, Renee says, this was just wonderful. All your previous presentations have been as well. Beautiful photos. Thank you. Anne says, fantastic, Steve. Please continue with future offerings. Jody said, loved all your presentations. Diana says, many thanks and so wonderful. Let me jump over to the Q&A. Uh, an anonymous attendee says, uh, has anyone been to all the national service units in the country? Steve, are you starting to work on all the units? I know you've done all the parks. What about the units? Uh, been to about half of the, a uh, little over half of the monuments. Um, if you're in the area, it's good to know of their existence. So if I'm in my travels around the country, I'll make note of an NPS. My, my passport has a lot of them. The answer to the first question is yes, there, there are a couple uh, very celebrated individuals who have been to all 423 of the, of the units. I mean, everybody wants a bucket list. and Some of them are pretty remote, way up in Alaska at the Bering Sea and stuff, but uh, they stuck it on and, and actually finished the, completing the visits of all of them. Uh, let's see. Francis says, thank you for all your presentations, Steve. Shinwei says, beautiful photos and a wonderful presentation as always. Christopher says, I'd like to see other state-by-state -state or historical or battlefield-themed presentations. Put that in the um, uh, feedback survey, uh, the last question of the feedback survey uh, tomorrow, uh, Chris. Uh, Rocco says, wonderful presentation. Thank you. An anonymous attendee asks, are guns still manufactured in Springfield? I, I believe the answer is no. It's now mothballed. Gotcha. And Zoe says, great presentation. Thank you. So why don't we wrap it there, Steve? Uh, wonderful job. Uh, I'm sure we'll see you down the line. We'll figure something out. And uh, folks, look for that email for me tomorrow with the feedback survey, the recording, and information about some other upcoming armchair travel presentations. Any last words, Steve? Whoops. Uh, nope. I, I, <laughs> obviously, you don't have to twist my arm to, to show cool pictures of great places. I, I enjoy just as much as you enjoy watching them, given your comments on, on the chat. Um, I have just as much fun revisiting it. So it's a, it's a good synergy. Let's, let's do more. All right. Thanks so much, Steve. Good luck with, uh, with your son's uh, tour, uh, you and him in the tour business. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you much.